with women and transportation and the unique issues that women often face in transportation. Um, and I can definitely say, don't have kids, but uh, I do worry about safety. And I'm always surprised when I tell my story of thinking about safety, and it can sometimes be very different um, from some of the, the people around. So very much looking forward to this. So I'd like to introduce Sarah Kaufman, who is the Associate Director of the Rudin Center for Transportation at NYU. She will be moderating this panel, and I'll let her introduce the rest of her panelists. Sarah, come on up. Thank you. I'd like to invite our esteemed panel up on stage. We have Michelle Baim, Gina Fiendaka, Gabriela Gomez Mont, and Karina Ricks. Please welcome them on board. All right, so thank you all for joining me today, and thanks to everyone who's attending this session. The um, Women on Transport session emerged out of a study that we just released out of the NYU Rudin Center for Transportation, which focused on women's experiences on public transportation especially. And we conducted a survey with about 550 respondents, of which um, about Three quarters of women respondents said that they had experienced um, sexual harassment or theft or verbal harassment while on public transportation. It was a really jarring number for us. And I'm wondering if we can hear from the panelists a bit more about their purviews and if they see similar issues of safety of women and femme presenting travelers in their work. Uh, Gina, do you want to go ahead and start? Sure. Um, thank you so much for having me here. I'm Gina Fiandaka. I'm the Commissioner of the Transportation Department in Boston. Um, we have several important programs that are really focused on safety, uh, particularly neighborhood safety. We are a Vision Zero city, which means that we have made a commitment to eliminate um, fatalities and serious crashes on our roadways. And we also have a neighborhood slow streets program. Both of those are really targeted at really improving neighborhood safety. And what's um, remarkable in Boston is that we launched a public engagement effort around both of these programs. And uh, our key partners are, are three advocacy groups, Walk Boston, Livable Streets, and the Boston Cyclist Union. Um, all of those organizations are led by women. So they've kind of helped us to reshape the conversation. And we know that when we make our roadway safer for uh, for one group, whether it's women or uh, uh, in our neighborhood schools, uh, we make it safer for everyone. And really that's what we've heard universally from folks in Boston through Go Boston 2030, our planning effort. Folks want safety, uh, they, they want to feel safe, and they want some placemaking in their neighborhoods. So that's really been a strong focus for us. Michelle? Hi, I'm Michelle Baim. I'm the Southern California Regional Director for the California High Speed Rail Project. So in my experience with my project, we're building a future project. We don't exist today. Uh, and this project, of course, would have stations arrayed across the state of California. And we then work very, very closely with the cities and with the other uh, transportation providers in those areas in terms of the station area planning and future access at those points. And some of the things that have really uh, cropped up for us with regards to safety in those conversations um, tend to be around the fact that today our transit stops tend to be less frequently used, except for maybe a major location like uh, Los Angeles Union Station, for instance. Our train stations and our bus, um, our bus stations, basically, or, or stops and facilities, don't tend to have a type of vibrancy around them. We didn't really plan them. And so as we, um, as we coordinate with urban planning, it's about 
adding features and amenities in the areas of these stops that allow for 24-7 activity in the area, lighting in the area, um, so that you can feel safe parking a bike there. Um, you have this other sense of security because there are other people there when you come to the station and leave the station. And so that's something that I've seen some really interesting programs on in terms of thinking about planning. Really, the, it's the transit-oriented community or development that ultimately can address some of those safety concerns in terms of accessing the transit. Uh, obviously, um, we aren't operating a train yet, so, uh, but the consideration of the safety of the passengers on would be important as well. So I'm Karina Ricks. I'm the director of the Department of Mobility and Infrastructure in the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, I'm also a, a mother of two uh, young children, uh, the daughter of two elderly parents, and the neighbor um, of various others. And it is... Uh, something interesting. I've been in Pittsburgh now about a year coming from Washington DC and really raising children in a city um, has given me a different kind of appreciation not just for the safety um, of the city but the experience um, of being in the city with um, more vulnerable users that you are responsible for. So things like waiting for a bus at the edge of a very busy street with two children and, and two active children um, who are waiting um, with you, getting increasingly bored, um, wanting to entertain themselves, getting precariously close to the edge of that street where the cars are flying by um, at high rates of speed, um, to be waiting on the, again, for the bus with a senior neighbor, um, helping him get to his uh, uh, medical appointment or something like that without a place to sit. Um, and so how is that experience for him um, being able to get there? Um, my neighborhood in, in Pittsburgh now is a, is a conservative Jewish community, and so every Saturday, um, seeing how this community really depends on walking around um, the neighborhood with their children, with their seniors, um, and have we provided the kind of uh, community that embraces that sort of cultural um, norm, that provides for it, um, that allows for that to be a natural extension. Um, thinking about bike shares, we sort of launched that in Washington, D.C. to great acclaim. But as I'm there with my young kids and thinking this isn't for me, there's no place for me to put these children um, on this bike. I can't really use this as being um, one of those modes. And so this is one of the things that we bring sort of to Pittsburgh where our mayor um, is, is known for this statement of if it's not for all, it's not for us, which is not entirely true, but we do try and make things work um, for all of the different users of our community, both safe, um, but also flexible and viable for their uses. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Gabriela, and I hail from Mexico City. I've been heading for the last five years Laboratorio para la Ciudad, which is the quirky brainchild of Mexico City for sure. So one of our agendas is actually focused on sustainable mobility, but we also do governance, such as crowdsourcing the Mexico City Constitution, et cetera, et cetera. So in a certain sense, a big thing of what we do is the experimental slash creative area of the Mexico City government is try to really bring a very different lens on some of the challenges and possibilities of Mexico City. In terms of mobility, it's actually quite a gargantuan challenge because um, 21 million people on a metropolitan area. Our subway system moves about 5 million people per day. Just one station sees 1 million people passing through. And our informal bus system moves an astounding 14 million individual rides per day. So since the city grew in size about 35 times since the 60s to now, the sprawling transportation system and all of the really quirky ways that we've had to deal with this uh, in a certainly organic, it has its own efficiencies, its own inefficiencies of you know, transportation being continuously invented by other populations, let's say Milpalta, which is a rural area of Mexico City has these fantastic golf carts that have been refurbished as illegal taxis. But I say, you know, if we're going to let Ubers in, why not the illegal? <laughs> uh, 
uh, you know, just like the, the these little electric, super efficient, super environmental friendly uh, options that local communities are having. But so basically, this this has uh, its big challenges in terms of just mobility in general. TomTom Tom and IBM say we have the worst commute, the most painful commute in the world. Um, and all of this obviously has a repercussion both on how we get across the city, but also the safety issues, and especially exacerbated when you put a gender lens. Um, unfortunately, the number one cause of preventable death across Mexico City in children and adolescents is actually road incidents. And for Mexico City, it's number two, and we had no road safety plan until very recently. So the place of the lab, even though we go for the more experimental space and really try to think about the city not only in terms of its physical infrastructure, but also its symbolic infrastructure, and if the way that we think about the city actually has an influence on the decisions that we're making both as government as well as civil society, let's say not necessarily considering ourselves a pedestrian city, but less than 30% of our population actually owns a private car, can there be shifts? That said, we needed to go deep into basic holes that were there. We have no idea what happens with the informal bus system. There's no map whatsoever until recently because we actually gamified the whole thing. Um, but we also did the first road safety plan based on the precepts of Vision Zero as well. This happened only last year and we brought in all of the activists of Mexico City to help us create this plan as well. Um, we also have right now, all of it, we, since we found very big gaps in the way that we've been collecting data, we right now have a really interesting program of data donors and we're working very closely with the insurance agencies who have much better data on this to really think about data collectors and how we can pool resources information to have a safer city. So there's several things that we've been doing, but many of them actually have to do with um, figuring out what those looming gaps are in terms of what we've been doing to make mobility a lot more efficient, and especially safer for the Mexico City population in general. Wow, so you're all doing pretty incredible work um, in transportation in general and in improving sa safety for people using your transportation systems. Um, one thing that we found through our NYU survey is that women who can afford to avoid taking the subway late at night and instead opt for Uber, Lyft, or other rideshare services, um, which they calculated adds up to about $50 per month in their transportation costs. That's, a, that's not a fair or sustainable model of ensuring safety of women. And I'm wondering if any of you um, have seen any particularly successful models of improving the safety of female or any travelers um, and Gabriella, I'd like to start with you because we had been speaking earlier about how Mexico City has separate subway cars for women and especially and even um, pink buses that are only for women. And I'm wondering if you can talk about some lessons learned from Mexico City and if any of the rest of you have seen policies that are that are particularly effective in this area. Absolutely. So we, we do have to go deep, and I think that there's some measures um, that have been interesting, and still we have huge challenges ahead at the same time. As you're mentioning, there, there are subway cars that are, that two to three su in, in subway cars are only women and kids. Uh, during rush hour, then it becomes for everybody, like, you know, after rush hour is over. And as I mentioned, rush hour is very intense in Mexico City with, uh, with those crowds, so it, it's been quite successful. The bus system I'm less sure about because, as I was mentioning earlier, if I'm waiting for a bus and then I suddenly have to wait an extra 45 to three hours for the, the women-only bus to pass, that's not necessarily that efficient. And so, since we, until next month, a project that we're doing, we have had no way of tracking where the buses are. There's no way for you to figure out at all where that pink bus is that you need. Um, another thing that we've been working on very closely, which is very experimental for Mexico City, though our European, maybe US counterparts would laugh of this as an experiment. We've only now inaugurated, and this was a, a lab project, the first line of um, when you know exactly at what hour your bus is gonna pass. So this is a first, and we did it with the night bus because it's the only time that you know uh, uh, that there's no, not these huge fluxes in terms of traffic and stuff. 
And it's been incredible because as a woman, imagine that you're waiting at 3 a.m. And you have in Mexico City, you know, Uber and even cabs can be prohibited. So this is not a choice. Like this is not if my bill is going to go higher, if it's going to go lower. It's just not a choice. So I need to do what I, ne I never I need to do to get home. Um, before you would wait from everything from 5 to 45 minutes at 3 a.m., which obviously makes it even more precarious for women. And this is actually by the next government. Um, they're going to take this pilot that we did on Insurgentes, which is the longest, la the longest road in the world, and they're going to actually apply it to the rest. And right now we're working with uh, the BRT system as well as the, the SM1 system that feeds the periphery that has GPS to actually also have for the first time a certainty at what time the bus passed. So I think it's these types of things that would, you, would seem to be catering to our efficiency, and they are, but they also uh, will address... Uh, safety concerns along with these other more uh, gender focused projects such as the 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 cars and uh, and even cabs actually there's also cabs that are only for women that's very impressive um, I'd like to move on to the kind of second theme of women on transport which um, which focuses on caregiving uh, women on a national level are overwhelmingly the caregivers in their family unit, which in the mobility sense means that they are often the ones um, taking around young children or elderly relatives to places like school or appointments. Um, according to a federal survey on this subject, 75% of caregivers in the United States are women. So this isn't a uh, small population that we're talking about. And um, the physical and economic cost of taking around other people can be enormous. So, Karina, although you spoke about being a parent, which is which is parenting young children in itself is a challenge, but especially taking them around is. But one thing that you've done really impressively in Pittsburgh is focus on lower income caregivers and single parents, um, and. What kinds of solutions have you found, or what kinds of challenges do you see that lower income caregiving populations are facing in particular? And are there any mitigation measures that you've seen work? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is the inconvenience, of course, of, you know, if you are dependent on means other than a private automobile to um, do a number of sort of errands, um, if you need to. Uh, drop one child off in one place, drop another child off in another place before you can get um, to your place of employment. If you are the one who's going to get the call, um, you know, that the, the, the child has acted up in school or is feeling ill, um, how are you going to make that trip uh, in the middle of the day, non-peak times, um, to go and get that child in a timely manner and then, and then resume whatever else you need to do? It's a huge inconvenience. It's one that we're aware of why, you know, part of our focus and part of the question that we're asking ourselves is with all of these new mobility options that are coming up, how are these new mobility options going to be available um, for those types of trips? We know that they're going to be available for, um, you know, the, 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 the typical single traveler um, without physical uh, barriers in their use, but will they be available for those who are traveling in tandem um, with one or more people, and if not, how can we um, do that? I think the other thing that we don't think about enough and need to, to really consider is the economic cost um, that this um, raises for people. So um, many of our transit systems um, have a, uh, maybe it is a, a small amount, but nonetheless they have a, a fee for the transfers um, that you're making. It's true in Pittsburgh. Um, in some work that I did in, as, a, as a consultant prior, many cities around the country do. Um, in one incident in, in Columbus, Ohio, as we were doing sort of some pop-up meetings and talking to people about how they would design their transportation system, uh, a woman, single mother, unemployed, um, was describing how she really would like to work, that she is, is eager to it, that she's been looking for different kinds of employment. However, uh, the subsidized daycare facility that her children go to was in the outbound direction of the bus line um, and the free fare transfer only worked if you continue in the same direction of travel. So, But most of the jobs were on the inbound direction of her trip and so for her to be able to um, pursue those jobs in the central city 
um, she would have needed to pay twice in the morning and twice in the evening to be able to drop her children off, um, pursue her job, and then do the same in the reverse, and that kept her out of the labor market um, because of that additional cost. Um, we know many families, when the transit is not working for them, um, they'll use informal jitneys, they'll use other kinds of, of sources because they're lower cost than the traditional ride share that's available or because they don't have the, the electronic uh, payment available um, for that. That not only introduces a substantial cost for them, but also a, a degree of uncertainty as they don't necessarily know who that driver is, uh, who has been vetted or not vetted um, to operate that service. And then, you know, maybe just finally, um, learning more about what are those employment opportunities that we're creating through new mobility. So I've not seen the reports and maybe should do some more research on my own, but um, you know, I would be curious to know the gender uh, distribution of, of uh, TMC drivers um, who are taking advantage of that income opportunity. Ancillary evidence suggests that women are the minority um, that are participating in, in those driving activities and sort of augmenting um, their income that way. Um, not only does that then not provide an economic opportunity um, for them to, to, to participate in that, um, but also um, we know that one of the reasons that they stay away from that is because of the sense of insecurity of bringing strangers into your car and the vulnerability that you may feel um, as a driver there. And so um, these are just some of the things I think we need to talk about. I, we don't have the answers to them, um, but daylighting them um, is an important part of, of addressing them. Thank you. Um, Michelle, do you wanted to respond? Sure. Uh, so, again, I think this gets back to how we contextualize our cities, how transportation, housing, and job um, advocates all work together within the development lens, uh, because there are a couple of things about public transportation. Um, unless you are in probably a contact, like here in the United States, like here in L.A. County, for instance, um, transportation, you go to transportation when it comes to you. So if we're in a situation where a train is coming every hour or at a random schedule, um, if we're in a situation where during midday uh, periods of time, you know, your, your transportation connection is 20 minutes apart or 40 minutes apart or something like that, then essentially you're dependent on transportation. Transportation isn't serving you. You are looking up a schedule and going to it. So part of it is it, the, the frequency and the ease of use of the, of the transportation uh, mode um, that I think tends to drive people, again, into a car as opposed to transportation. If, if it isn't something where you can just show up and you know something's there in five minutes, it isn't at your demand, right? It's, it's, at its own, it's on its own schedule. And so addressing that is really important, but I think really it's the development patterns that we need to take a look at. Um, because sometimes in the center cities where the jobs are, also the square footage costs are higher. So it's prohibitive to have childcare facilities there, right? They're being built in other locations. And so how do we kind of tip that balance and equalize that so we have our jobs, our houses, right, um, and our childcare in the same locations or on the same, um, on the same uh, uh, routes. Here in Los Angeles County, with regards to LA Metro, uh, they don't have a transfer uh, fee, so you can transfer from subway, light rail to bus uh, just by tapping, uh, and so that is a convenience that we've taken a look at here in Los Angeles. Yesterday there was a discussion about the opportunities in, of mobility hubs where people kind of congregate in one area and then they have the choice of rideshare and bikes and other activities. And I, it sounds like it would be helpful to tack on to these mobility hubs some pretty robust childcare options. Um, that so it sounds like that's what you're suggesting. Yeah. So please take note, anyone in the audience who's building out mobility hubs. Um, 
Gina, did you want to mention on the caregiving front? I think sure. you had some thoughts on that. Yeah. Uh, so in 2017, Boston released uh, Go Boston 2030, which was the city's long-term uh, mobility and transportation plan. We heard from thousands of residents. Um, and what we heard is that they want these mobility hubs. And that is something that we're focused on building out. So every resident in our city should be within five minutes of a bike share, a car share, a um, good transit opportunity, and along with that goes all of the sort of placemaking and what makes a neighborhood a vibrant place to, to live and work and play. Uh, you should be within walking distance of, of stores and shops and, and child care and restaurants and recreational activities. All of those things really help to make our neighborhoods a livable place. But, um, to, to really think about neighborhood, uh, about safety uh, in, and how women have sort of shaped that conversation and amplified it, maybe we go back to thinking of uh, Mothers Against Drunk Drivers and they were really at the forefront of amplifying the conversation and what is safety and what's our responsibility. Uh, part of our responsibility is to make sure that we've got the um, engineering capacity to make safe roadways and sort of nudging our uh, partners on the engineering side to focus on what's important to families in, in neighborhood security. Those are really good points. Um, I want to move on to our third and final theme of this discussion, which is women in transportation leadership. Although uh, transportation has tr traditionally been a male-dominated field and much of the tra transportation infrastructure that we use today was designed by, by males for a specific type of nine to five commuter, we're seeing different types of travelers, different types of trips, um, and more diversity in transportation staff and usage. Now, all of you are accomplished female leaders in the field. How do you um, promote other forms of diversity? How do you promote diversity within the leadership levels in the transportation field? And how has your experience been, each of you, how, how has your experience been as a female leader in this field? Um, Gina, would you like to sure. kick that off? Um, I would say that as a leader in the transportation field that it's critically important that we mentor the next generation, that we play it forward, uh, that we cultivate an environment where women can advance, where uh, diversity is welcomed, that women can have access to STEM programs in, in our public schools, and that we really actively create that environment where women are, are promoted through, through the ranks, given the opportunity through uh, job share and uh, other you know, flexible work time that some w women need in many levels. Uh, I think that you know, we've all benefited by strong mentors, and, and certainly I think that's a responsibility that we share. Yeah. So my experience, uh, before I uh, joined uh, the project that I'm working on, I came from the private sector, and so I have uh, the experience from both the public and the private sector, and it's kind of interesting because sometimes we think of the public sector as adopting change more slowly than the private sector, but within transportation, I actually see um, the public sector adopting this change, really valuing diversity uh, when you're working on transportation because transportation touches so much of people's lives. Really literally the decisions a transportation agency make affect everybody and they affect everybody's lives and that's something that I think is, is um, that understanding has been growing over the course of, of the last decade or so, largely because public transportation agencies have been promoting women and they have been seeking that diversity of staff, more so even than some of our private sector companies. And so in this area, I think the private sector is kind of catching up to uh, the public sector 
And um, it's, it's broader than just women. At the end of the day, if you are going to design a transportation system that is going to serve your diverse city or service area, you have to have that type of diversity reflected within your agency in order to really contextualize and plan for that future system that can address everybody's needs. And so it's a huge benefit. Uh, and I would certainly encourage anybody listening to think a lot about that. So in Western Pennsylvania, I would say that we are uh, really in a very unusual moment. Um, the Secretary of Transportation of the state is, is female. Uh, I am as the, the head of transportation for the city, as is the executive of our transit authority, uh, as is my chief traffic engineer, my lead engineer, and my lead planner. Um, and the uh, and the the head of my sign and paint shop, I didn't do that. That just is the the, the talent pool, I guess, that we um, have there. But having said that, so we do have a lot of of, of women leaders. Um, I think that we still have a ways to go in changing women leadership, though. Um, I still see that we, uh, not to overgeneralize, everyone has their own um, leadership style. Um, my style and, and that of, of uh, many women that I know is one of more collaboration, of opening the doors to the tent a little bit more, taking in um, more opinions, um, having more dialogue about what the opportunities are. But at the same time, what we kind of hear is that sort of interpretation is, oh, she's uncertain of that, or she lacks confidence, or she doesn't know how to make that decision. And I, and I need to be clear with the staff that dialogue doesn't mean democracy. I'm still making the decision. Um, but I do want to bring in those other opinions. Um, and that's something that I think a lot of the, the, the male uh, colleagues that we work with and, and those that are within the agency just don't understand the notion of kind of opening that up, bringing up that more kind of collaborative space, um, but still uh, Understanding that the, that the that the authority still stands, and that's not um, necessarily reshuffling um, that organization. So, um, just I think a different leadership style and familiarizing people um, with that is something that we um, still do. That we don't need to kind of continue to participate in the same lead leadership style that we've seen, um, kind of bringing us to this point, which is one of very top down. Um, management, um, but that we can also change the style of leadership in addition to changing the leaders. Uh, several thoughts occur from our Mexico City experience. Um, one of them is definitely, I think, that there's another way of making decisions and creating holding spaces for conversations. So one of the things that I I got on my plate at one point in time was when Uber came into Mexico City. After France, it was probably the most contentious, most violent place, like huge protests stopping the city, uh, front page news on every newspaper. Uh, you know, Uber is really great at creating a lot of pressure and a lot of tension to, to basically force governments to, to regulate and create policy around this. And uh, it was hitting the mayor directly, and I wrote him and I, 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 I asked him, um, so what would happen if we hold the citywide debate on this? Uh, a digital debate, and he was like, what is that? And I briefly explained, and he has, who else has done it? I'm like, nobody. How do you know it will work? I don't. <laughs> and he was like, silence on the other end of what's up. And he was like, okay. Um, so basically what we did was actually try to think about how to reframe the conversation instead of thinking, is it inclusion, is it innovation, which is a false dichotomy, I think, for starters, or, but rather, how do we do both? How do we think about that a government's role is actually to be an enabler of new ideas and new mobility proposals or transportation proposals in this case, but also to think about the social component and the social aspects and the externalities that are happening every time that there's one of these shifts um, so we did a digital debate, we brought in about 70 people, and the way that this got regulated, I think, was um, 
quite different to the way that would have happened if we did not have a more inclusive, more of a holding space for really tough conversations because it didn't get easier. Like the first time that the taxi leaders and the Uber directors met face to face was in our rooftop that we host a lot of public events there. Um, so you know, it was incredibly intense, but I do think that there's something to be said for that holding space. I do think that there's a next evolution. Uh, transportation in Mexico is incredibly male dominated, even though fortunately other areas of politics are seeing a beautiful gender um, shift. Congress right now is 50%, ministers on a federal level 50%, ministers on a local level in the next government 50%. I mean, it's, it's quite amazing, uh, especially again because politics has been very male dominated. We do have a way to go in, in transportation. Um, there's all of the taxi leaders and the bus leaders because in Mexico City until very recently, you could actually own your own bus. Uh, believe it or not, so you could say, like, I want my bus, which is yeah, especially interesting. Um, so we just passed a law that now we have to have companies, but there's still many bus companies across Mexico City, and they're all male-dominated. Um, so, and then I think that there's a next step. What happens, I, I do think that even though you bring women into the conversation, um, patriarchy, as they've said, is an ideology that seeps into the bones of everybody, not only men. So have we been thinking beyond, uh, let's say, in terms of bus design, what you were saying about your kids? Are we designing seats? Are we designing access with a gender lens? Or are we just trying to be more inclusive in terms of the 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 percentages of women. Like what is changing because there are more women in the conversation, I think, is the next series of questions and challenges to be asking of ourselves. You read my mind. Um, I actually wanted to deflect that question to Michelle because she is working on building basically a new transportation system from the ground up. So what does that look like? And what does inclusivity look like when you're building something entirely new? Well, the other interesting thing about what we're building is, is we're not building it in one location, right? So we're building an 800-mile railroad across the state of California. Our phase one is 500 miles going from San Francisco down to Anaheim. And so if you think then through that context of the most urban areas of the state of California then now connected to some of the most rural areas of the state of California. So you think about that in, uh, inclusivity, if you will, and that connection. So in that sense, you're kind of breaking down a barrier, right? Now you're creating a situation where those regions and, and, and um, have much better access back and forth. Now, what do you do then at those specific locations, at the entrance point of the system, at, as if you will, at the station locations? Because that station in that more rural area is a different consideration, or even in a more suburban area, is a different consideration than the station that you might be looking at in Burbank, for instance, here, or in Anaheim. So. Again, we are, um, the great news is, is we have a lot of transportation agencies here in a lot of cities here in, in Southern California, which is my area, um, that are very progressive. So we work with them basically on station area planning and very careful analysis of making sure that there are multiple ways and multiple connections to get into the location where the station will ultimately be located and connections that it's not, we aren't planning to put a station in any location where there isn't at least a couple of other transportation connections already available, whether they be bus connections, rail to rail connections, we're doing um, new airport rail connections where they don't exist today and um, things of that nature as well, because it wouldn't make sense for us to stand alone. That isn't what we're trying to accomplish. Um, so that's one of the other things that, uh, that we certainly are looking at is that connectivity, but we have intensive, we actually were able to grant through our federal grant to cities hosting our stations, station area planning grants, to really take a look at the zoning and all of the kinds of policies that surround the station to make it a more inclusive, more accessible location. 
Um, so we don't have, you know, we don't have the final answer yet uh, because we haven't started the construction of any of our stations that we would construct ourselves. But um, stations like Arctic at Anaheim, uh, uh, historic stations like Union Station, um, are all also part, and so we have active work going on there. Those are, those are really good points, and in a moment I'm going to open up the discussion to audience Q&A, so if you have a question, please uh, tee it up. Um, in the meantime, I want to let you know that if you'd like to look at our NYU report on this concept of the pink tax, you can visit nyurudencenter.com. And um, you can learn more about what we found through our survey. I also really want to tell all of the speakers on this panel that I really admire you. And if you're all familiar with the concept of shine theory, um, where basically if one of us succeeds, the rest of us do as well, um, I hope that going forward, any groups of under any underrepresented groups within this agency within agencies and within the industry can help promote one another and that's how we can all shine together um, so I'd like to open it up for audience Q and a it might be lunchtime <laughs> Good morning. Thank you for your presentation. I'm a mayor of a northern California city. I'm also the board chair of the bus district and the transportation authority. So I salute all of you women in transportation. My question is just in the way that you were looking at uh, child care services in their location, are you also looking at senior services and hospitals and where those are located relative to transit lines and transportation services? Thank you. Yeah, I, I'll uh, answer just for, for Pittsburgh. We have a high concentration of persons with disabilities in the city in part because of the tremendous uh, healthcare offerings that we have there. Um, and we have a very, very organized um, body of, of folks that participate. So we have um, different neighborhood organizations in particular, one known as o Oakland for All, um, who've really been helping us um, look at our city through that lens, look at the city from the navigation standpoint of, of different types of disabilities, um, but also really looking at that distance um, factor. So um, we've been doing a lot of uh, human-centered design. I know it's like the, the buzzword lately, but um, really bringing people in uh, to tell us their own stories, to tell us the stories of real journeys that they take, um, to understand what those constraints are. and. Um, too many times we've heard the stories of uh, Pittsburgh is a hilly city, we have some very steep grades, um, of people saying, I haven't been able to take that job or I ultimately had to, to give you know, my dream job up because it was an uphill walk from um, the bus stop to where the place of employment was and I simply can't, can't do that. Um, to your question about the healthcare uh, facilities, that, those types of stories then prompted us to look at um, what are the access routes from, even though, you know, on the map, they're within an easy quarter mile walk um, of some of the transit facilities. That quarter mile um, has a number of different street crossings and has different grades that need to be navigated. It may or may not have shade, which if you have concerns about regulating your body temperature, that matters a lot. Um, and so really trying to look at it through those different lenses of how that affects people making that journey, um, in addition to just where those facilities are located. Yeah, I would, I would just quickly say, I think it has to do um, a little bit here, certainly, as we transition, you know, kind of from the suburban uh, paradigm to, you know, an urban paradigm in many places, is con um, thinking about community as opposed to density. We all understand here um, as we move forward that we will be more dense and you know I'll obviously um, I, I would expect you know something about uh, density but you can plan that as a community and if you plan it as a community 
it's something that involves health care, it involves senior care, it involves um, child care. Um, and the notions kind of more centered around maybe multi-generational households, which hasn't been a tradition here in the United States, but I feel like we're moving more towards. Uh, so that's what I would answer, and then I would be very curious to, to hear um, how you're looking at that. Uh, two thoughts occur there. One of them, one of the big paradoxes of Mexico City is it's actually naturally polycentric because, as I mentioned, it sprawled 35 times in size in not that many decades. Um, so many of these places actually have, let's say, there's 327 uh, public marketplaces across Mexico City. I mean, if we just did an inventory of the public infrastructure of Mexico City, I think we'd be quite astounded, and that includes daycare, hospitals, family structures still play a huge part, definitely puts a toll on women for sure, but many times the family takes over the daycare things. Um, so in a certain sense, it's more what is giving us our huge, really painful commute times is work and living and not necessarily the public infrastructure that surrounds it. And then one of the things that I found very intriguing as a second thought from the lab, because we, we as I mentioned, mobility is one of our six agendas, um, is how do you widen the scope of the paradigms that you're stepping into? So one of the things that I offer up as a provocation um, is that Mexico City actually has a beautiful program called Medico en tu Casa, which means doctor at your house, where for the most marginalized communities in Mexico City, you get free medical care at your house for people that for any reason cannot make their way to a public hospital. And on my way here, I was having a discussion with my Lyft driver, um, who we, because we were passing through and we were talking about health insurance for some reason. And uh, he, I was telling him that there's free health insurance in Mexico City. And he was like, well, that's not sustainable. <laughs> so I have the feeling that you know, we need to widen the lens of how mobility integrates into other, uh, much larger visions of what cities and society should be doing for their population. And then how we can actually move and work with, from other paradigms with other agencies to think about what mobility means. I mean, having the city, as you well said, I, I love that idea, having the city at your doorstep instead of thinking that you have to move to them, especially when you have an illness or you have a disability, I think is a beautiful paradigm shift that I'm, 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 you know, I'm very proud of that Mexico City program. And you know, in Boston, I, I'm so glad that you brought up the, uh, how we address the elderly. This panel. Um, but basically, what we've been seeing is that through the lab, we've been able to do call for proposals that is actually having not the use of suspects be part of these conversations, but you know, some, many times when we think of procurement, we think, okay, like the BRT procurement, or these huge things. But this company actually did a super interesting model for the system that feeds the periphery, which is basically what is part of the population that is giving us our huge commute times, and there's an equity lens that is being put to this. And I love that the first time the AI will be used to make uh, the decisions that government is taking much more efficient and kind of like a human machine combination is going to be for the people that have been the hit hardest by the commute time. So instead of technology being uh, reaching them at the last, it, they're actually going to be the first to benefit historically from new technology AI. And it's really interesting because we've been seeing in our pilot programs my team was telling me that at one point in time during rush hour, again, we're very creative in terms of our solutions. I'm not sure if efficient, but definitely creative. The bus driver will turn around and ask people, can I take the express route? And everybody will vote. <laughs> and then they'll take a completely different route to what officially is supposedly designated. So can we take this dynamic elasticity of the city and our population and actually make better choices with the help of technology, I think is, uh, is going to be a really relevant discussion. Another procurement process that we're going through right now, in one month time, we will inaugurate a first street for kids typology that will be done for and by kids in one of the most marginalized communities of Mexico City, and a borough that has half a million kids. Um, in it, uh, under 14 years of age, but they have no public space because this space of Mexico City uh, f was an informal settlement that now has been formalized but still has absolutely no public space. Like you can walk for 30 minutes at some point of this borough and not find one single public space. And there's actually talking about gender, uh, there's places where let, let's say the girls are historically raped 
and you know it's it's not an easy social environment. Um, so can we create new typologies? And so we foot the bill as well as the processes for working in a different way for the borough. And then the borough, when they see if it's successful or not, can take on their own budgets to actually expand and really think about a wide-reaching policy. To the environment question, I forgot to say that we actually will have our first woman mayor in Mexico City come the 5th of December. So the largest city in the Western Hemisphere will be run by a woman, um, which is fantastic, yes. And there's a really interesting thing that the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Environment, the mayor herself, they all come from environmental disciplines and they're all women. So I think really interesting things could come out of this combination of finally having like a, 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 an environmental uh, multifaceted view of Mexico City in the future. Wow, that's a, that's a fantastic note to end on. Unfortunately, we'll have to close off this interesting discussion, but I'm sure the panelists are available throughout the day to speak with people who might be interested. Um, so thank you all so much for your insights and your intelligence and your kind of wise generosity on this panel today. And for any women and other underrepresented groups in the audience in this industry, let's uh, rise each other up. Thank you. Thank you.